All right, the f point to the first session was to provide you with a framework by means of which you can have the context, see the six stages of ratification. And th in this session, we're going to do a case study of three of the ratifying conventions, the three that matter, it seems to me, the most. The turning point, Massachusetts, <clears throat> and then the final push and huge debates in Virginia and New York. Uh, so let's take a look at um, the Massachusetts ratifying convention, Jason, if we, if we can go there. Please. All right. Uh, yes. So what I've done here is provide an introduction which shows the context of the Massachusetts, how long it lasted, where it was held. And if we, if we scroll down a bit, it, it tells you what they focused on and, and um, who changed their mind. I mentioned that there were 10 people who changed their mind. Who were they? And I, I, to the best of my ability, I, these, not knowledge, these are, these are the people who changed their mind. Not much is no, known about them, but they went in, shall we say, reluctant to say yes. They came out saying yes. Maybe still with reluctance, but they said yes. Uh, I am not going to focus on their lives, but I do want to mention that it is important that for, for, this, for understanding this democratic process, it's not so much what you do when you win, but what you do when you lose. And that the democratic republican process, I'm saying democratic republican in order not, because the word democratic is today associated with democratic party, republican seems to be associated with republican party, and in order to avoid my remarks being somehow simply distilled into a, one or the other party, I'm calling it a democratic republican process. That's sort of my rhetorical way out of being pinned to one party or the other. I'm an American. By choice, not by birth. My job is to teach you natives how to understand your own country. <laughs> <laughs> and I could do that without fear of having to ever become president because I'm disqualified. Okay. And if you want to know where I came from, I bet you wouldn't be able to guess. Right, see? Good. Now I've set you up for lunch. Okay. So you can read that as back background material. What I want to do is to focus our attention on the day-by-day -day summary. So I've provided a day-by-day -day summary of what went on in Massachusetts. And it starts on Wednesday, January the 9th and the appointment of committees and officers. Very, very formal, very ritualistic a discussion of contested elections. Did somebody get here by any regular process? Uh, procedural, very, very procedural. And they make an agreement. <clears throat> How shall we proceed to discuss this constitution which is in front of us, which has these six articles, plus the seventh article, which in fact triggers why they're there, namely, call a convention. So they all gather, all elected, for this particular purpose. And they sit down and say, on the first day, how shall we proceed with our discussions? And the answer they give is, let us begin at the beginning and make our way through. And we can present our objections, present our questions, but we won't, but we won't vote and say, yes, on Article 1, and then move to Article 2, and then say, yes, or not. let's talk about the entirety of the document, and then we will vote. Yeah, 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 right, 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 let's do that. Okay, so where did they begin? You'd think that they would begin, if you have a copy of the Constitution, which I know you don't have because you've committed it to memory, so you don't have to do that, but they begin with a preamble. We, the people, do ordain and establish uh, six purposes for which this Constitution is, is written. And they, they are the, the regular purposes that 
virtually all nations are, are, are in pursuit of, which is sort of domestic tranquility, you know, peace at home, uh, common defense, uh, namely our existence abroad. Um, the very union itself we want, that's a peculiarly American one, though, that this union cannot be broken up. And I think that is at the heart of the civil war, the war between the states, that it, it, this is a perpetual union. So the union itself becomes something which is uh, general welfare, which is of course subject to some, some sort of dispute, but I think they meant, they meant that this constitution is as addressing problems which we share in common over the continent, general welfare. Uh, you could, but once the words have left your pen or, or lips, you no longer really own them, and the next generation can can interpret them, <laughs> maybe incorrectly, uh, whatever. But that's, that's a part of what it means to be human. And I would suggest that the welfare state of the 1930s plus managed to find its way and legitimacy partly through the general welfare clause of, uh, of the preamble. But that's an, another question. And then, so those four sort of things, <coughs> with the possible exception of union, what we might expect Britain to do, Poland to do, Colombia to do, they want these four things. What makes America sort of American? Is, is differ from making Britain British or Colombia Colombian is that is these two shall we say non-procedural or what we might even raise to the level of moral concerns that is liberty and justice and that raises a whole bunch of questions like what is liberty what is justice and how does this constitution secure liberty and justice and somehow the six articles that go on, minus the seventh, which triggers the debate, <coughs> has something to do <coughs> with the four more fundamental, union, tranquility, etc., and the two more, when I say fundamental, I mean basic, and the two more sort of unique, liberty and justice, uh, have something to do with it. All right, so with that background, I mean, where do they, where do they start? I would, expect, I would have thought they would have started with the preamble. And had a chat about what does this mean? What are we buying into? Uh, but they don't. They seem to say that's fine. That, that's fine. So what do they do? They start with Article One. Article One, Section One. It says that we shall have a bicameral constitution, which means we shall have we shall have a House and a Senate. A lot of historians say that means we shall have a lower house and an upper house. The framers never use that phraseology. They say the first branch and the second branch, which is very different than having a lower house and an upper house. Lower house, upper house smells of Europe. Upper class, lower class. First branch, second branch means the first branch is the one that's closest to the people. The second branch is to check the first branch. So there's you've got checks and balances. Fine, says Massachusetts, not a problem. So two chambers, bicameralism, accepted. Article 1, Section 2. That talks about the details of the House, including the census and electoral provisions. How does the House get elected? They stop there. All right. Next day, Article 1, Section 2. So there is some debate over the nature of representation in the House, but not very long. They move away, they don't even talk about Article 1, Section 3, which happens to be the Senate. Fine, no problem. Article 1, Section 4 is this time, place, and manner clause. And that, uh, <coughs> the concern is that the federal government, Congress, will, will alter the time, place, and <coughs> manner of holding elections in the United States. Well, they have slightly over the years. That is, the Congress has decided that the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November is election day every, every uh, two years or whatnot. And if, without that piece of congressional legislation, the states would be able to hold elections whenever they wanted to. So there, there has been some standardization. But, uh, but the concern with the op opponents is that they may move it to Britain. They may move it somewhere where people can't go and vote. So there's a, there's, a, there's a suspicion, in other words, that if the federal government has power, it will not only use it, but abuse it. 
So, so you could see that concern entering into this time, place, and manner clause, which we don't pay much attention to today. But then go back to Article 1, Section 2. Again, the, the idea of how delegates are elected. The Friday, Article 1, Section 2. So Massachusetts is really concerned about the representation of people in districts and what constitutes um, an, an appropriate level of representation. We've been talking about that ever since. The goal was one for 30, a representative for every 30,000 people. What do we have today? One for 600,000 people. So there was a concern then, and, and the, the way that concern was answered was to say, well, Congress will increase the number of representatives to Congress as the population increases. And that happened until right around World War I, when the population of the United States was, say, about 130 million people, and there were 435 representatives. Since then, we have 435 representatives, and the population has jumped from 130 million to 310 million, which means the scale of representation has altered. I think that is a huge issue which needs to be talked about today. <laughs> Namely, if the, if the power of the general government has increased, one way to check that power is to increase the number of representatives so that the power gets checked by the number of representatives. But what we have over the last hundred years has been an increase in the authority and reach of the general government and a decrease in the scale of representation. The only way to solve that, it seems to me, is one of two ways. One, to devolve certain power back to the private and state level or two, or and two, to increase the number of representatives. But in order to increase the number of representatives to a level that even approximates one for 100,000, you would have to increase the size of Congress to 3,000 people. And I don't see American people going for that at all. And the saddest part for me is today is that the the branch that is held in the lowest esteem by the American people is the Congress. It should be the branch that should be held in the highest esteem. That's what public policy people should be looking at. Why the first branch is held in the last place. But they're talking about this question in Massachusetts about representation. So if, if anything so far in this first week that is concerning the delegates, it's this representation question. Article 1, Section 3, they finally get around to the Senate, okay? Right. Then they move to other parts of Article 1. And Article 1, Section 8, they stop at. <coughs> and quite, excuse me, quite rightly. If you're really interested in the Congress, after dealing with representation, you need to deal with the powers of Congress. What power does Congress have? The answer is 18 listed powers. Starting off with the power to tax and going to debt and ending with the uh, all necessary and proper uh, power to put into effect the foregoing powers, among which are the power to regulate interstate commerce, the power to raise armies, the power to declare war, uh, and also a power which is not often attended to, but I think is extremely important, the power to, to encourage the development of the practical arts and sciences uh, and, uh, and the mechanism by which that's to be done is through the patent office, uh, giving patents for limited time. If there is anything in the Constitution which should encourage you to believe that the framers were in support of a commercial society, a society based on encouraging entrepreneurship to, uh, to improve the lot of the society, that's the clause. Because, because what Congress can do to imp is build roads, build infrastructure, and also to protect ingenuity and creativity by granting a patent for a limited period of time. For, forever is monopoly. For a limited period of time, you can recover your costs, and then, you, you, then so you have copyright for a limited period. Right, so you should be talking about what powers Congress has. <coughs> and 
Article 1, Section 8, all day Tuesday. Article 1, Section 8, all day Wednesday. Um, Article 1, Section 8, all day Thursday. All day Friday. Bam. So four days on Article 1, Section 8. And I'm saying, good for them. Because that has been at the core of American politics since. Do I read Article 1, Section 8 liberally? Uh, or do I read it in a constrained fashion? Are the powers of Congress constrained to what is specifically listed there? Or do I have elbow room through the elastic clause of Article 1, uh, the necessary and proper, to expand it? The Affordable Care Act falls completely within that kind of perspective. And, and the interesting thing about Judge Roberts' decision is that he <laughs> is that he said it doesn't fit under the Interstate Commerce Clause, but it does fit under the Taxing Clause. So that we're still having some conversations today about exactly what is the reach of Article 1, Section 8. It's at the core of one of the most important judicial decisions in the 19th century, which is McCulloch versus Maryland. It's part of the, uh, uh, over the bank, it's an important part of the decision, an extremely important decision in the 1930s, which concerns the New Deal, and can, can Congress and the President expand the role of the federal government? And, and the court said no. And it is at the core of the Affordable Care Act. So Article 1, Section 8, from the very beginning, so if you wanted to trace, I mean, what did the framers mean by Article 1, Section 8? You don't just look at the convention in Philadelphia, but you have to look at how the ratifying conventions interpreted it, and what the people thought that they were buying into. So I would go to Massachusetts, in part, to try to find the beginning of that conversation. Article 1, Section 9. Ah, there we go. Article 1, Section 9, among other things. Excuse me. Limits the power of Congress. This shouldn't come as a surprise. If Article 1, Section 8 states the powers of Congress, which it does, says this is what Congress can do, it should come as no surprise that Article 1, Section 9, right after it, will state what Congress can't do. A sort of Bill of Rights of the people or the states. So Congress, for example, can't pass a Bill of Attainder. Congress can't pass ex post facto laws. Congress can't issue titles of nobility. Congress can't uh, mess around with habeas corpus unless in times of rebellion or, 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 or a crisis. So there's a sort of a Bill of Rights limiting the reach of Congress. Among the compromises that were made was Congress can do nothing with regard to the slave trade, overseas slave trade, and in those states that currently think that importation is okay, until 1808. And this is, it seems to, this is the most important, I mean, there are, three, <coughs> there, are, there are three clauses that deal directly with the issue of slavery, even though slavery, the word, is not mentioned at all in the Constitution. And Lincoln makes a lot of that fact, quite correctly, in my opinion. But the clause that is the most important is this one, Article 1, Section 9, which restrains Congress from doing something about the slave trade. Why is that the most important? Because both sides understood that the position you take on the slave trade will have consequential effects on what happens to slavery. We might think that's a short-sighted view, but that's the view of both sides. Therefore, if you can limit the slave trade, Next in line is limiting slavery. <clears throat> if you can control what Congress can do with the slave trade, then you can control what Congress can do with slavery. So the compromise was made, which is Congress shall do nothing with regard to limiting the slave trade into those states which currently say it's okay. So Congress can help Massachusetts, for example, which is what this debate is about. What if Massachusetts doesn't want the slave trade? Does this mean that, that Boston has to tolerate slave trade ships coming into Boston? And the answer that Mr. King gives is, 
No, it just says Congress can't do anything with regard to those, those states that currently think it. Massachusetts is not one of those states that currently think it. Therefore, Congress can help Massachusetts. Really? Why doesn't it say so? And on we go. Why do Americans think that they feel safer or freer by writing things down? When, in fact, virtually everything you write down is subject to interpretation. Ask your kids. Ask your younger brothers and sisters. Ask your students. You never said that explicitly. No, but you know what I meant. Well, then why don't you say so? Do I have to say anything? I'm playing. I'm playing. Bam, 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 bam. And you say, that's cruel. I said, but it's not unusual for me to slash anybody. <laughs> and you say, but, 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 but it says you can't do cruel or unusual. It doesn't say that. It says cruel and unusual. Oh, come on. Language matters, but common sense also matters. Right? Sometimes and is used as but, sometimes but is used as and. So how do you figure that one out? Throw the Constitution out, say some. It's all about power anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. I say that Americans want to feel secure and safe. So we write things down. We have written things down since the Mayflower Compact. We write things down in contracts, in covenants, agreements. And then there's all kinds of loophole language. That's why we have lawyers, one for 270 Americans. At least in Philadelphia, in the old fat Philadelphia, they had one pub for every 400 people. I'd rather live there. <laughs> but this is the point about Article 1, Section 9. What does that mean, then, for Massachusetts that has already abolished slavery, already permits African Americans to vote? turn back the first Massachusetts Convention because it restrained the vote to white, to white men under 21. And then it was altered to men under 21. The word African and black was excluded in the Massachusetts Constitution. So the concern in Massachusetts is, what have we bought into with regard to slavery and the slave trade? That's why it comes up here. You wouldn't expect it to come up quite so often, maybe in certain other states, but you would expect it to come up in Massachusetts. Sure enough, it does. So if you're giving a course dealing with slavery and you want to understand the origins of some of these things, I would say that looking at the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention is a good place to start some of this conversation. Article 2, which is the presidency. They don't seem to be concerned about the president. By the way, Massachusetts is the only state of the 13 at that time which elected their governor. All the other states, the governor was I mean, elected by the people. All the other states, the governor was selected by the state legislature. All the better, my dear, to make sure that you behave yourself. So that, in a sense, the Constitution copies Massachusetts with regard to the development of the presidency. So that they're not particularly concerned about the whole notion of the imperial presidency, the presidency going out of control. Article 3, the judiciary. They don't seem to be concerned about the judiciary getting out of control and why, are the, why is the judiciary not select, elected and all of that. They just go bam, bam, pass over it. Article 4, nothing. Article 5, amending, that's all right. Artic Article 6, who's, who's boss? Article 7, Fine, this is why we're here. So the debate is over. So now what do we do? The recorder declares the con conversation on the Constitution being ended. Mr. Parsons, a delegate, moved that this Constitution do, that this convention do assent to and ratify this Constitution. All right, so the question is on the floor. What happens? Bargaining, negotiating. What are they negotiating over? Ratify without blinking. Ratify with conditions. We will only ratify if you do such and such and such within a certain period of time. Or say no. So they let the negotiations begin. And this is what is, this is, this is, what is happening. That certain amendments, nine of them, nine of them are proposed. And see, and, and, <coughs> The attempt is, through these nine, 
to persuade, through these nine proposals, to persuade 10 people to say, in the first Congress, our representatives in the first Congress will push for these nine alterations. No guarantees, no conditions, politic decent politicians shaking on it, and this is, is that good enough for you? And the 10 said, yes. Now, I can't imagine that happening today. This is not a question of, we need to be civil. This is a question of, do we understand the limits of politics and the necessity of bending without breaking? Because if we don't understand that, then democratic politics is out. You might as well let a judge decide, or let a tyrant decide, or let a king decide. If you let us decide, we're gonna come with all kinds of different views. So we either shoot each other, or we come to some agreement which satisfies not all of us at all. But that's what the game is. And then you say, I'll try next year. That's why we have elections. So two years from now, I can go back and say, you know, I voted yes, but I changed my mind. Or I voted no, and I changed my mind. But it requires that kind of open-mindedness to be able to make a democratic republic work. That is civic education. So let me just say this particular. A lot of folks are, are disgruntled by, by electoral apathy. What we need to do is to encourage civic engagement. So goes the story. I am much more interested in civic education. That is that people become educated as to what it means to be a citizen. And being a citizen doesn't simply mean going out and protesting. It means understanding things that we've been talking about this morning. To be very blunt, I, why should I encourage people who don't understand what they're doing to go out and be engaged? I mean, but you know what? That shows my age. <laughs> it also shows that I'm an immigrant. <clears throat> All right, so Mr. Adams, Sam Adams, just had a brew, and he's come back <laughs> and makes a proposal. And there's, a, there's a high ground and a low ground. And it, the high ground and low ground involves the president of the convention, John Hancock. Low ground, John. You know, we've known each other a long time. You have a great signature, and the King George saw it too. But we have a, I have an important proposition for you. What's that? Proposition is George Washington is going to be president. We all know that. But we have to have a vice president. And Washington is from Virginia, and we need to balance the ticket. We need somebody from Massachusetts in order to go along. How does the, I, and you know, you know, the general can't last forever. Even the general. So what does the ticket Washington Han Hancock look like? Vice President, stepping stone to the presidency. John, call in your chips. 10 people out there must owe you one. I'll do it. High ground. John, you know there's been a contest in America between two sources. The Virginia sources who are the constitutional folks, Madison, etc., pushing for constitutional change. And the Massachusetts folks, who were the ones who really at the heart of the revolution, Concord, uh, Boston, Tea Party, whatever. So between Massachusetts and Virginia, we are the revolution and the constitution. What would it look like, John, if Massachusetts becomes the first state to reject the constitution? Our honor, our position is at stake. Your honor and position and leadership is at stake. Couldn't you do something? Yes, I can call in 10 chips. Now, I think there's a difference between low ground and high ground. Um, and I would like to sustain that difference. Whatever, we get an agreement. And the agreement, I want to repeat, is do we say yes and close our eyes? Do we say yes and make a recommendation? Do we say yes under condition? Because there's a difference between recommendation and condition. Or do we say no? 
The deal is, we'll say yes with a recommendation, the Massachusetts Compromise. And interestingly, those who voted no stand up right at the end. Um, according to the recorder, several gentlemen, ah, uh, tee hee. Right. What? Why, 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 that's because I'm doing it the wrong way. <coughs> Several gentlemen said a few words each on the proposition of amendments which was acceded to... Uh, wait, wait a minute, no, keep going down, please. I, I, I've, I've locked it the wrong place. It's right at the end. After the vote, Mr. White, Mr. Widgery, Mr. Whitney, Mr. Cooley, and Dr. Taylor all had voted to oppose ratification, declared their support for the new con Constitution. The next day, Major Nason, Mr. Randall, and Major Swain all had voted to oppose ratification, declared their support for the new Constitution. Now, that is a story that's not often told. What do you do when you lose? Do you sue, go to Canada, burn the house down? Hire a lawyer, or do you say, I gave it my best shot, you won, congratulations. I'll be back. They'll be back. <laughs> there is important, because that's the peaceful transition of power, what do you do when you lose? Okay. So we made a case study of one of the three. What I want to do now is not the same depth, but to just run through quickly, within the next five minutes, I want to run through very quickly the Virginia and New York to show you what they were interested in and what happened there. So if we go to Virginia, um, day by day, um, let's go to the day by day, all right. So they meet, they do everything, they like the president, they appoint on a committee and such and such. So they, they get reported and this, that. All right, so they start with the preamble. Oh, Virginia starts with the preamble. Okay, and here is Patrick Henry at his rhetorical flourishing best. He says, and this has been quoted in your various textbooks, this is where it's from. Patrick Henry was extremely uneasy at the proposed changes of government, that is from the Articles to the Constitution. He fears that much of such a drastic change from a confederation to a consolidated arrangement puts the liberty of the states in danger. Henry discusses the preamble and asks, where did the delegates get the right to use we the people instead of we the states? That, for Henry, is the issue. And you can trace that all the way to the Civil War and beyond. Are we a nation of people or a nation of states? The preamble declares we the people of the United States. Not we the people of America, but we the people of the United States of America. When we elect a president, we're not electing a pre an American president, we're electing a United States president. Uh, but that's Henry, and Henry is about the only person in all the ratifying conventions who makes a case about the preamble and the wording of the preamble. And his key is, we the people versus we the states. And they've already made an agreement that they will work in an orderly fashion from the beginning, which is the preamble, all the way through. As you, as you keep going through, the preamble is again. Then they move to Article 1, Section 1 and 2. Article 1, Sections 1 and 2. Article 1, Section 1 and 2. 1 and 2. 1 and 2. Why do they stay there? Because Henry won't let them go on. He is the master obstructionist. And, wh and why is he doing that? Because the rules say, let's give it thorough coverage and move on. And he is not obeying those basic rules. As soon as they try to move on, he moves back. As they try to move on, he moves sideways. Um, <laughs> Madison insisted on a regular progressive discussion than by that unconnected, irregular method which they had hitherto pursued, which means Henry is a pain. 
<laughs> and they all know that Henry is a pain. But that is part of the problem of democratic politics, Republican politics. What happens if you have a pain in the ass in the room? Who has rhetorical ability? And who's going to filibuster as much as possible until you ask him, what will it take for you to shut up? And Henry will be very pleased to tell you what it will take for you to, to make him shut up. And then, and then he'll probably say, let's go out and have a drink. Okay, uh, at this point during Mason's speech, the convention recorder made italicized some. All right, anyway, so you go on. So June the 12th, we're still on Article 1, Sections 1 and 2. Right? Then go on. Article 1, Sections 1 and 2. Why? Because Henry wants to talk about. Wait, wait, all right. Article 1, Section. Article 1, Section 1 is bicameralism. Henry doesn't want bicameralism. Section, Article 1, Section 2, is we the people in the House. Henry doesn't want that. He digs in and he gets a following. So, we, so one whole week of debate. You must have been at debates where, where nothing happens, except, except exhaustion. And you go to bed at night and you say, I sure hope it's not going to be like that tomorrow. And Henry wakes up and says, boy, am I going to give him hell today. <laughs> and it goes on. <laughs> Guess what? Guess what? They finally moved to three, four, and five. Then to six, then to seven, then to eight. So this, this is going to take time, right? Naturally, because the powers of Congress, they go on. Article one, section eight, yes. Article one, section nine. They do raise the question of slavery. And what the person who's raising the question of slavery is, did you guys in the convention give away too much? Massachusetts is concerned that they didn't go far enough. People in Virginia are concerned that you went too far. So it's a very, very, you know, very interesting. Anyway, you can keep doing this. Keep going through Virginia and you will see that finally they get to a discussion on Article 3. Article 2, Article 2. They're more concerned in Virginia, obviously, with the presidency. Article 3, the judiciary. And what is fascinating, and I encourage you, to, encourage you to read this, is that there is a young delegate there called John Marshall. And the question arises, what power does the judiciary have? And what is the role of judicial review? And John Marshall says, the court has judicial review. And this is 15 years before Marbury versus Madison. So it makes for a fascinating read if you want to, to do this section of the Virginia Ratifying Convention where John Marshall is talking. Read that along with Federalist 78 and Brutus 12 and then read Marbury versus Madison. That could be a very powerful uh, one day or two day uh, uh, lecture series uh, and seminar series that you could have with your students on the origin of the judiciary. Um, and, and on they go. Well, what happens? Let's, let's get to the end. They're still moving. Article 3. Article 3. Article 3. Finally, Article 4. Uh, now, they somehow they say, right, we've done it. Time to vote. So what do they do? They talk. What are they going to talk about? Are we going to say yes? Are we going to say yes with an asterisk? Will that asterisk say conditional? Will that asterisk say uh, recommended? Or shall we say no? The proposal is basically that in the first Congress, representatives from Virginia will propose a Bill of Rights. And this is the arrangement which is, essentially, which is essentially made. And the rest of this page shows you the, the, what, um, the proposed Bill of Rights. And that leads us to the Bill of Rights section. Remember, the Con Constitutional Convention and the four-act drama, the ratification, which is what we're doing, and then comes the Bill of Rights section, which I've already done. 
Right, so this is, uh, this is leading into the next section. And sh what we will see in that section is the extent to which what happened at the Virginia Ratifying Convention is absolutely essential for understanding what rights are in the U.S. Bill of Rights and what rights are not in the U.S. Bill of Rights. This is the debate that has an impact on the first Congress. New York, the same. Except at the end, the opposition is a bit more powerful and they say, you know, we want to make it conditional. If at the end of the first Congress, a Bill of Rights is not included, we want to say that New York can secede from the Union. And that is the first talk of secession, but it was defeated. And um, so New York joins with an understanding that in the first Congress, a Bill of Rights will be introduced. And so that, in effect, uh, is, is the end of session two, which is a case study of going through the Constitution, what kinds of questions and concerns were raised. And we've got, uh, say, five minutes that we could take to, to questions, and then uh, and this afternoon, then we will look at the out-of-doors debate with the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, paying attention in session three to the Constitution and human nature, uh, the idea of faction, and then this, the fourth and final section will be on constitutionalism and an institutional framework. So I'll take a, a, a couple of questions before before lunch. Can we can can we do that, Janet? Yes. You're all hungry. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> When you, um, when you were scrolling through the notes from Article 1, Section 9, um, I, I, I didn't see all of it, but it seemed like both Madison and Mason were actually criticizing the Constitution for not going far enough as far as the slave trade was concerned. They, it seemed like Mason was stating that it was morally evil and yes. uh, why was more not being done. But, but you, you also mentioned, obviously, that, that um, there were many that were um, fearful of what, what was included in the Constitution. So was, was there kind of a split between yes. the Virginia delegates then? Yes, yes, there was a split on that. And it's it, it, part of the obvious split is that Virginia had the largest number of slaves. And people have, a lot of folks have become used to the fact of having slaves. It, in the Constitutional Convention, when they talked about, about this, Mason and Madison took the lead against slavery. Low ground, high ground. Low ground, and I'll be very low, we can breed our own. High ground, <laughs> who knows best the impact, the negative impact of drugs on you? Who would you go to to ask? What, what kind of bad drug do to you? Who would you go to? A drug addict. Oh. <laughs> An official, an expert? What the heck do they know about anything? By the way, which reminds me of a joke. <laughs> I was talking with folks the other day about whether it is still possible to have the Good Samaritan story. And the, yeah, the answer was yes. Here's, here, here, here's what somebody told me. The Good Samaritan today is a social worker, an expert, was walking down the street, looked in a ditch, and there's a guy battered, bruised, bloodied in a ditch. And a social worker looks at him and says, the person who did this to you needs help. <laughs> that the high ground is, that if you, Mason's point is, slavery is bad for the slave, but it's also bad for the master, because it turns him into a feudal lord and not a free person. Madison is saying that if we're going to limit it, just limit it to this generation. 1808 is no accident. It's 20 years from the Constitution. 20 years is a generation. So that even if you could quote grandfather in this existing generation, there is no reason to make public policy so that the yet unborn or the young 
have to abide by that. So I mean, we do that in policy today, in, it, from, the, from the silliest to the, to, to the most profound. We say we have an exemption. We have an exemption for those who are currently used to that. But from 2025, all cars must be this, that, and the other. So I understand that, that when we're talking about slavery, we're talking about not cars, but, but this idea of grandfathering in is a very American exemption manner. Mason and Madison would love to see it slavery ended in 1800 or even earlier. But you have people there, who, including Patrick Henry, who says, I'm just too used to it. Yes. Was there, were there many states that um, had some concern about the Electoral College? Was that part of, of any of the uh, ratifying conventions? And, you know, because really, if we have more than two candidates, there's a very high tendency that the House of Representatives is going to decide our president each and every time. Was it, did that come up in any debates or anything like Not that? Not really. No? So everybody was okay with the Electoral well, College? Well, I would say okay, but it wasn't a... It, 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 the concern about the presidency was the imperial presidency. It was the abuse of power. That is, they, um, the use of the veto by the president. There was less concern about how the president got there because the president would be in for four years. The concern was, could the president interpret the powers of the presidency in such a way that it became the equivalent of a king. So when you read the Federalist Papers, 70 and 71 and 72, there is some talk about the Electoral College. But the main, the main point in the Federalist Papers is to, is to try to, to counteract the claim from the opposition th that Article II creates the potentiality for an imperial presidency. And the way in which you limit the imperial presidency is not by having direct election of, of, of the president, but rather by limiting the powers specifically and expressly to the president. So the president cannot interpret commander in chief clause to be a clause to go wandering to slay dragons in wherever you want in the world or, 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 or in the Crimea or whatever. It's just, it's, commander-in-chief of the army and navy when called into duty, and it is Congress to call into duty. The concern was that the president would interpret the presidential clause to advance the presidency. And it's been within the last 50 years or so that there was this concern that the Electoral College may be inconsistent with a, with a 20th century, 21st century understanding of democracy. And I think back at the founding, there were a number of ways in which you could say democracy. That is, you can collect a majority votes in a whole bunch of different ways. It doesn't have to be through a, a direct election. By the way, Madison and James Wilson were in favor of direct election of the president, but they abandoned it because they thought it would be much too difficult over such a large territory and to do. And moreover, you could almost guarantee, they said, that you would have a recount every time. So isn't it much better to have it done by district by district or state by state? We could move right now without a constitutional amendment, without altering the Electoral College. We could move right now to have uh, the presidents elected by 435 districts. There's nothing in the Constitution to stop that. It's up to each state to determine. Is each state over the years has virtually determined, and two now have reversed, is that it's done by winner take all. Some, one objection to the Electoral College is the winner take all. That can be altered without a constitutional amendment. And you could still have the Electoral College. Just do districts. Which means, you could say, how undemocratic? Answer, how federal. Which is another reason why Delaware and Connecticut were perfectly satisfied. The Electoral College brings the states in. The error in contemporary scholarship is to see the Electoral College as keeping the people out.
One last question. Yes. Yes, I wonder if you could speak to the nature, the perpetual nature of the union and how big a role that discussion played in the uh, ratification debates. Did Was there a general sense that the states were signing on to a perpetual union? And um, again, was that contentious? Well, it was contentious. I would say yes, the understanding is that they're signing on to a perpetual union. In fact, even the Articles of Confederation <laughs> indicate that this union is going to be perpetual. The problem with the Articles is that they didn't provide, provide very well for its perpetuity. The way in which the Articles thought they were going to secure perpetual was to have everyone agree to any change. That was their mechanism for, for, for making it perpetual, so that everybody would be on board at every moment. <clears throat> but that almost turned a perpetual union into an imbecilic union. So there's a way in which we can be perpetual and not be dumb about it. And I think that's the real challenge. In those three conventions that we looked at, there was a discussion about the perpetual nature of the union, which is why conditional ratification was dropped. Particularly in New York, because Hamilton wrote to Madison and said, we can get this passed in New York if we agree that at the end, that, that some kind of change can be made by the end of the first Congress. And Madison said, I'm going to do my best. In fact, Madison was the one who introduced the Bill of Rights in the first Congress. I said, we've got to do it. And other folks in the first Congress said, why? The election's over. Why do it? And Madison's point is, because we made a promise, because I understand the perpetuity of this union, and that we need to do it to bring various people on board. Because if, if there's a, a group of people who are influential, who are excluded, this union is not going to be perpetual. So for prudential sake, never mind principle. So, so Madison wrote back to Hamilton and said, I realize that you think this is a good deal. We, there's a yes vote, and it's, they've given us a year. But don't buy it, because what you're going to buy is trouble. You're going to buy trouble down the line that somebody at some generation is going to come and say, New York bought into conditional. Why can't we today? Which is basically the South Carolina Secession Ordinance. So I think Madison was very, very right, which is why once joined, you can't remove. But once, once you say no, you can come back and say yes. That is, you can change your mind in the correct direction. <laughs> and in fact, in the Federalist Papers, we will see that the first 14 essays discuss why the union itself is necessary. And this union is out. So, in effect, I would say that the union, the union qua union, union as a union, becomes part of a sacred objective of the American experiment, certainly in the 1850s and 1860s. Okay, time to eat. <laughs>